Hi, and thank you so much for joining me today to watch this new masterclass, The DNA of Tomorrow's Companies. How I wish we were all together right now, back in an exhibition hall, standing up in front of you, you guys sitting in front of me, doing this so it's more interactive. Alas, we can't do that because of everything that's happened in 2020, but we know in the future we will be back. We look forward to seeing you in person again. I think it's important this year to, to adjust and rethink about our presentation, our masterclass that we did last year. Last year, we, we spoke about things that you could implement in your business to, to succeed and be stronger for the future. But alas, everything happened in 2020 and it's sort of thrown everything out the window and we need to rethink about it. And that's the reason I'm revisiting this masterclass to help you today to put some tangible things in place for your business to move forward. So thank you so much for watching, as I said before. Now, when we last spoke, we spoke about the DNA of tomorrow's businesses, and we used some case studies. We used Netflix with Blockbuster Video, we used the music industry with you know, streaming services such as Apple and Spotify. We spoke about other examples, and we concluded that businesses that were failing all had the same DNA, the same thing in common that they had an outdated business model. They hadn't really thought about what they were doing or adapted to that change. They lacked innovation, they ignored technology, and they had a, a culture of not liking change. We concluded on the last presentation that the DNA of tomorrow's businesses were the companies that combined online with offline. We, we looked at case studies, we looked at ways B2B companies could do that and B2C companies could do that. We spent a lot of time discussing that and giving you ideas to take that forward into your business. Of course, when we last met, we weren't, we weren't predicting the global pandemic and COVID-19 impact. Like many, many people, COVID-19 has affected us in a bad way, both from a business point of view and from a personal point of view. You know, if you think about this year, it, we had the 13 week lockdown. Businesses were closed. Bricks and mortar premises weren't open. There was no human interaction. And you think we're in a lockdown at the moment, again, as I make this video. This should be a live webinar right now. But due to the COVID restrictions, I can't have enough people in the office to be able to monitor that and make it easy to do. So we're making pre-recorded videos. We're having to change all the time and adapt. And it's been hard. I'm a business owner as well. And this year, working in, in my strategy and the strategy of our clients, we've implemented ideas and new ways of doing things that have helped um, succeed and grow the businesses and move them forward going forward. But not just from a business point of view, from a psychological point of view as well. COVID-19 has had a huge impact. And it's an impact that not many people really talk about in the business world. But just from the way you, know, you pitch to new prospects, the way you communicate to existing customers, the way you interact with your own team, the people that work for you, it's all been thrown up. Humans naturally don't like change. Some people really love it, but as a, as a vast majority, people don't like change. They like routine, they like process. And 2020 has just thrown that out of the window. And for me, what would make COVID worse than it already is if we don't learn from it and we don't change the way we're doing things going forward. COVID-19 has been a terrible thing for lots and lots of people. Unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of people around the globe have lost their lives. Families have been shattered. Businesses are struggling. People are being made unemployed. People are still on furlough. I don't want to talk about all the negatives of COVID because I think today's more about what we can do to drive forward and what tomorrow's DNA of a company looks like. I think that's the important part of this masterclass that you're watching today. But I think it's also good that we've done this recap. So what has been happening around, the, around digital this year? Well, I remember reading an article back in the summer that said that the, co that the COVID lockdown that we had, the 13 week lockdown we had back in March of this year, propelled digital by 13 years. Working with lots of B2B and B2C and e-commerce customers, I would actually be more bold to say that COVID-19 has propelled digital more like 20 years. 
the numbers that we see, the statistics that we see from our e-commerce companies, our lead generation customers where we're, we're getting new leads online for them. Actually, digital has grown so fast. And we're gonna come on to that later about how you can use digital uh, a lot better. But let's look at some quick numbers. At the last masterclass, you may remember a very similar slide where we spoke about the number of internet users and mobile users. What's interesting for me this year is social media. 0.6 billion users up, 600 million people up around the globe using social media. And what's really amazing for me is the adoption and take up rates of new social media channels. When we last met at the masterclass, we were talking about Snapchat being the latest kid on the block. Now we're of course talking about TikTok. Now TikTok were very lucky, they were propelled into the mainstream by President Trump because he, he waged a war against it, which was great free PR for TikTok. But it's one of the fastest growing social media channels of our time. Social media's on the up, internet users around the world, unique mobile phone users, it's grown. And of course, the population stayed about the same. So we know that digital, we said before that digital is important, now it's even more important. And we're, as I say, we'll come on to that in a little bit later. Coming from an e-commerce background, and an agency that does a lot of work in e-commerce, I picked some stats out about the growth that we've seen online this year. We've seen new opportunities, new markets emerging. I took four sectors here of fashion, food, furniture, and toys and hobbies. Look at the growth rates that we're showing. 19% online for furniture appliances, and 16% for toys, and 13% for food, and 18% for fashion. When I put this uh, slide together, there's other sectors. They've all shown tremendous growth rates, one of the largest years for growth rates. Now that's no surprise because we couldn't go to the shops. People were going online. Online was attracting new users. I'm gonna use my mum here as an example. My mum buys online already. She was doing that way before COVID. She is an adopter for because I've been hammering on to her for years and you know helping her like every son does and gets those phone calls. How do I reboot the computer? But we've been helping and she's been growing her internet knowledge. This year, she's buying stuff she's never bought online before. She always argued about buying her grocery delivery online. Her classic line back to me used to be, I wanna pick my own fruit and veg. I don't want what they give me. This year, she had no choice. She was forced into e-commerce for her groceries. Now, she won't go back. She doesn't wanna go back to a supermarket. It's not a pleasant experience, pushing a trolley around the supermarket, getting pushed into, noisy, lots of people, and she doesn't wanna take the risk with her health. Now, every week she gets her online delivery, she goes on, she books it. She's never gonna switch back. She represents millions of new people that will not go back to the high street. The news and the press talk about the high street and the effects on, uh, of COVID-19. The high street is not an effect of COVID-19. All COVID-19 did was fast forward the demise of the high street. People want to buy in different ways. We spoke about this in the last masterclass. We spoke about John Lewis, how they were combining their online and offline experience. In the, in the industry of retail, online with offline can still be combined because we all do online, but the parcel still comes offline, still comes from a human and a parcel and a tracker. But e-commerce has new markets available and it's not gonna go backwards. We need to think about how we use that information by making it easier going forward with the new markets that have opened for us. I know other people that are not in my mum's generation that for the first time have bought new things online and they won't be going back as well. They find it easier and they like the choice and they like the ease of it. What's also been interesting for me during 2020 is the split of how we're consuming data and on what devices we're doing it. So this year, laptops and desktops, tablets, and other devices such as gaming, PlayStation, smart TVs, have all seen a decrease in the amount of bandwidth of internet users they're taking up. Look at tablet computers, minus 27% of, of, of bandwidth goes through a tablet compared to 2019. Look at the mobile phone, 53.3% of all internet usage is now through a phone. 
We always knew they were important. We always, you know, used to harp on that when we're developing a website, we start with mobile first and then we look at desktop. Now it's more important than ever. We are a mobile, work from anywhere people. That's how we are now. We're not fixed to one address. We're not fixed to going to the office every day. We're flexible, we're free flowing and technology has worked around us. So, our introduction spoke about the DNA that we said about in last year's presentation. We looked at some new data, we looked at some of the impacts of 2020. If we want to move forward and be stronger for 2021 and beyond, what do we need to do? Where do we start? You may remember I used this very slide in the last masterclass because it's a great way to start the DNA. You may also remember that in last year's masterclass, we didn't tell you, I didn't present to you what I believe was the DNA of tomorrow's companies right till the end. And then I showed you case studies and gave some um, ideas about how you could achieve that. In this year's masterclass, I'm doing it the other way around because I think the, the, the actual DNA of tomorrow's companies is way too hard to predict. I actually think the DNA of tomorrow's companies is actually the DNA of your company in the next six months. Because one thing that COVID has shown me and my clients that I deal with is that we have to act quick and fast. So my first point about the DNA of tomorrow's companies is about those companies that are agile. They don't listen to the rule book. They don't listen to the, we've always done it this way, we will do it that way in the future. They've thrown it out the window. I remember back to March, when, you know, as a business owner, you know, we didn't know what to do. We were in new territory. We didn't know what the guides were, the rules. We didn't know how to talk to our customers. We didn't know how to talk to our prospects. We didn't know how to talk to our, our staff because it was all changing. The goalpost was changing so fast, but we were agile enough to work through that. I worked very hard with my, with my management team at CDA and our customers to help them implement technology and strategy that got them around that immediate lockdown, about how they could communicate with their customers, how they could keep uh, correspondence with their prospects, how they could market in different ways. I had so many customers coming to me and saying, we've got to do an exhibition, that's where we get our leads from. Think about us, we used to get leads at exhibitions. Yes, we gave masterclasses, but you'll remember we had an exhibition stand where people come up and said, hey, we want to do a website, we want to do a mobile app, we want some marketing, and we used to get leads. We can't do face-to-face -face lead generation. We've had to be agile and adapt to new ways of doing things. And for me, any business now has to be agile because Yes, we're in a pandemic with COVID-19, but what's next around the corner? What's the next hurdle? What's interesting about COVID-19 actually is that Bill Gates, if you Google Bill Gates' um, pandemic TED Talk, he did a TED Talk years ago on the biggest threat to humanity in business was a pandemic. How right he was and how the governments of the world didn't listen. It's not about the pandemic now, it's about how we change and we're agile. Now, agile is not a new idea. I've mentioned it before in past masterclasses, in past presentations. So why am I repeating it again today? That might be a bit boring, you might think. Well, it's not, because companies are still not doing it. And it's the most important thing to do. You have to be agile. So that's my first part of the DNA of tomorrow's companies. We've got to be more agile. Second part for me is a thing called Kaizen. Now, years ago, I started my career um, at Churchill Insurance back in the early 1990s, when Churchill was, uh, was the second direct insurer to, to hit the UK market. And it was founded by a chap called Martin Long, who coincidentally founded direct line car insurance with a guy called Peter Woods. But they separated and Martin Long had a different value for what he wanted direct insurance to be. And that's why he started Churchill Insurance. And obviously we all know what a success story Churchill Insurance was. But he believed in this one word. And when we used to, uh, when we joined Churchill, we went through an induction program. And we were taught this word, and it's called Kaizen. And it's changed for the better. That's what it means if you look up it in the English dictionary. It's about not only being agile, but adopting change. Now, humans, as we mentioned earlier, do not fundamentally like change. They like routine. 
So not only have you got to change the mindset of your customers, the mindset of your future prospects, the mindset of how you even talk to your future prospects through new types of marketing, but you've also got to think about how you're agile and that you show change the better to your team, to your staff, to the people that work for you and represent your brand. For me, that's really, really important. So actually, the DNA for me of tomorrow's companies is two slides. It's Kaizen and being agile. That for me is the DNA. If I'm bold enough to predict a DNA of tomorrow's companies. What the rest of the presentation is now going to demonstrate is how we can implement that. So we're not going to hang around too much what the DNA is. We're going to talk now about how you can implement change in your business for the better. And hopefully some of these ideas will really help you. So armed with the information about being agile, about adopting change, where do we begin? What, what can we implement in our business? And I'm going to start talking first of all about brand positioning. If you remember back to the last masterclass, we spoke about start with why, how that's much more powerful a message to your customer, to your prospect, about saying why you do what you do, not what you do. It gets people more loyalty to your brand. And we use Apple as an example with their technology platforms and hardware. This year, what is brand positioning? What do we need to do to our brands? And I actually think that John Lewis have completely nailed a brand positioning in 2020. And I think the introduction of their video, their Christmas advert, was perfect timing to demonstrate what brand positioning is all about in 2020. John Lewis's Christmas advert is very different to anything they've done before. You may remember last year we had Edgar, the, the, the fiery dragon, and this year we've got a message called Give a Little Love. They've took the, 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 the feeling of the country and, and the love and the community spirit that's been built through this year and pull it into their Christmas advert. They're being socially responsible. They're showing to people we're not just about a business to make money, we're about building a community. This advert has partnered with charities. We've seen social responsibility so much increased during 2020. The, the Marcus Rashford um, example is a great one with the, with the school mills. Yeah, people are more aware about community. Community spirit has never been stronger. John Lewis have brought that together. Community. We're all about communities. Communities are trying to build communities at the moment. I was speaking to somebody a few days ago about their, their Christmas shopping. And they said, well, I'm not gonna buy my, my Christmas shopping off a big internet retailer this year. I'm gonna try and get more presents from local businesses that are really struggling and that could really do it. It's community spirit. This video, this advert that John Lewis put together is all about community spirit. It references so many things that have happened in 2020. Their message is changed. It's all about give a little love. It's all about responsibility, community. And they're very empathetic to what's happened in 2020. And people, when they see this video, the reactions that I've seen from people with this video is John Lewis are being pitched as one trying to bring it all together. They're not talking about themselves. They're not talking about come and buy a product. They're talking about community-led uh, positioning. And I think brands would be very well advised to think about their positioning. Communities and people and consumers at the moment are all about brands that are giving back, that are trying to help raise the community. John Lewis is a global brand. It's in many countries of the world. It's a, it's a huge brand here in the UK. Yeah, that's a big brand trying to be regional and help local and small communities. I think they've absolutely nailed it. And their Christmas advert is a complete test testimony to that. So think about your brand positioning. Is it the same as what it was this time last year? Do you need to refresh your messaging? Do you need to refresh what you're saying to your prospects and your customers? Do you need to rethink about the terminology? Do you need to think about the, the social impact? Do you need to think about the charity impact? Are you working with charities? Are you trying to help them? Not just by giving money, but by giving resource and help. For me, start with your brand positioning. 
So we spoke about brand positioning. The next thing I want to talk about is regional trading. I mentioned earlier the John Lewis advert, they're talking about communities and regional trading. Big international company, huge company in the UK, they're doing regional trading and regional community work. Recently, Google have launched two new adverts, one with Anthony Joshua and one with Sheridan Smith, about Google Local. During 2020, we've seen a massive boom in local and regional commerce. I think back to lockdown, I think about our local high street. We've got a butcher's, a greengrocer's. The butcher's was obviously allowed to open, but they knew people would be queuing. So they introduced very quickly, a very quick way of people now to WhatsApp them to place their order to do click and collect. They didn't have a big e-commerce website. They'd never heard of e-commerce before. They were a, a small independent butcher shop but they use technology with the knowledge that local people want to trade locally. And if you think about that message, what it actually says is for the first time, regional businesses, community businesses, are on the same level playing field as the big corporates. So think about the local butcher shop versus Tesco's. Everybody knows they can get onto the Tesco's or, or Sainsbury's or Waitrose or any of the grocery stores to buy their meat. They didn't, they were trying to buy off the local business. So yes, they were still buying things from the, from the big boys, but they were trying to spend their money, the consumer, on local businesses. We took more inquiries during the uh, early part of this year from local businesses wanting to trade with local businesses. Why? Because they don't want to deal with people where there's long distances. They, they weren't quite used to Zoom, they weren't quite used to video conferencing. So if they can find a local business to work with. Now these customers, and I'm talking B2B here, like working with local businesses. Other, other clients of ours have had an increase in local business B2B um, selling. And local businesses, we know from working with them, have had an increase in online spend. Regional search has never been um, bigger on Google. And as I say, you know, Google has obviously two adverts about local small businesses adopting review platforms on Google to boost their, their, their rankings in search and to boost their awareness and their, their trustworthiness using Google reviews. So Google have invested that. Google have seen that in 2020. And I would suggest that you think about how you can use regional as well. There's a massive growth in digital. Take this butcher shop. Back in March, they didn't have a website. They didn't have any forms of e-commerce. What they did was create a WhatsApp chat. They put it on a big notice board outside their shop. Place your order on WhatsApp. The order was placed, they cut, the customer come through and paid for it. Now, six months later, that same butcher store has an e-commerce website. They're selling their meat online. They're delivering their meat for the first time. They don't have any footfall anymore because of all the restrictions we're going through, but they can still trade. Butcher shop was very agile. They believed in change and they did it. They used technology. Are you using technology in your business to drive that change? Are you using digital to seek out local? Just creating your Google profile so you can get your reviews is about becoming digital. Are you doing that right now? Is your Google profile correct? Have you got the right contact information? Are you getting reviews? Local trading has been quick to adopt and is well supported by local communities. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that people are all about trading locally and supporting their local businesses and their local community. Are you using your business to do that? Are you harvesting that information? It's a level playing field out there at the moment between the big boys and the small independents. It's, it's, you know, it's reset all of the things that we thought were important and it's changed it forever. Are you adopting that and are you becoming local as well as further afield? Make sure you are, because it's a, it's a great tip. So the next area that I want to talk about and give you some ideas around is the searches coming from voice activated smart speakers, such as Siri on your iPhone or such as Alexa um, from Amazon. The amount of search queries has doubled between 2020 and 2019 in this area. 42% of UK um, user, uh, uh, homes now have a smart speaker. 35% of all US homes have a smart speaker. 
Did you know that in 2020, so far, that 40 billion has been spent online, resulting from a search term starting on a smart speaker? So you may be sitting there saying, hey Siri, where can I buy a mountain bike? Hey Siri, where do I get my, my, my local butchery store? These are searches that people are looking for. And we need to make sure that you start coming back in those searches. Now people seem to struggle already with normal organic search engine optimization for, for normal desktop and, and mobile when you're sitting there typing in searches. So people say to me, well, we're struggling enough with that area. How do we then optimize our website and data to come back in voice search? And actually, it's the same as search engine optimization. It doesn't have to be complicated. If you remember back to my last talks, I used to call it making Google happy. Well, this is about making Siri and making Alexa happy. How do you do that? And the answer is you introduce into the, the data of your website or what are called snippets. This is what the speaker will look for to make sure you come back. It's just called snippets and we can discuss this in more depth if you're, if you're interested. But literally, if you look at your website, you, you're familiar with things such as metadata, which is the keywords for normal search, snippets sit alongside that. And it's those snippets that get read back from the smart speakers. One thing I should have mentioned before and earlier in the presentation is that after this um, online masterclass, I'm more than happy to have one-to-one -one or one-to-a-few people workshops on subjects that you want to talk about. And we'll give you some more details at the end of the masterclass about how you can contact me and we can arrange these one-to-one -one or one-to-a-few um, workshops. But start thinking about is your website coming back in those searches? Uh, smart speaker search is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as we get more and more um, uh, more detected from our actual physical devices to do search for us and with the introduction and the boom in the smart homes as well. The thing about voice. So now I want to talk about global opportunities. Now you may think, well hold on a sec, Stuart, a few minutes ago you were talking about regional trading. And I was, but I think global can also be part of your strategy as well as regional. What do I mean by global? Well, here's the thing. If you're a B2B company and you currently have an offering, or if you're, if you're selling something or a service, your traditional approach to selling that service was to get a lead, go and see that lead, show them the service or product, pitch to them, win the pitch, they become a customer. That was the normal cycle. And you'd have perhaps teams of people, we used to call them the sales reps, they're now called business development um, managers, and they drive around the country and they bring that business in. Well, actually, as we said earlier, there's been a huge shift in people using technology to communicate, such as MS Teams, Zoom, Google Hangouts. We're now used to doing uh, online video calls. Even though we're used to it, how many times a week do you say to somebody, you're on mute, people still keep forgetting to push that mute button. But why is this important? Well, the world is now your oasis. You can sell anywhere in the world. You don't have to go and see people to win business off them. At CDA this year, we haven't done any face-to-face -face exhibitions. We haven't gone to see people. We haven't had a lead come in and then driven to their premises to talk that through and meet their teams. We've done it all on video conferences. And the result is we've won business in a much shorter time. We don't have to spend hours driving around or, or our hours sitting on trains going to see people. We jump on the Zoom call or the, or the MS team or the video conference call and we're straight into it. All that process is reduced. So if you're selling locally, great, but now you can sell to the world. It doesn't matter where your customer is because you can use video technology to talk and win. And those people that you're uh, uh, pitching to get it. They know that they're not going to come and see you. I remember so many times people come into our offices when we've done a pitch. They want to come and see us. They want to see our offices. They want to see our people. They want to see people sitting behind big IMAX being creative and creating nice artwork. They wanted to see that. Now they don't. They want to talk about the business. They don't want the travel. They don't want the unnecessary uh, time waste. And they want to get on. The result is it usually takes for us at CDA, for example, about 
seven to eight weeks from meeting a new customer to pitching it and getting a decision about the piece of work. What we found during 2020 is that's been reduced down to a couple of weeks and it all happens a lot faster. We run business from further afield. We already had customers um, in the US and we had customers as far as Hong Kong, but it, it wasn't the bulk of the business. Now we're getting inquiries from all over the world. We did a big exhibition last year in um, California where um, some of you um, watching this would, would have met us for the first time. We're now doing more business with the US than ever before because of the video conferencing systems. That barrier of demographic and distance has completely been demolished by, the, by what's happened in 2020. So think about your business. Can you set your sights further afield? Also, think about when you want to employ people. This is a real thing that I found. So, um, fortunate for us during this year, we've employed a few new people. Whereas before, I used to put a job advert out, I get a few inquiries for people local to the business. What I've found during this year is that I haven't got to employ people local to the business. They don't have to come to the office anymore. They, we, we've introduced a remote working policy. Um, during the mid-lockdown, we introduced a work from anywhere forever policy, allowing my team to be flexible about the hours they work. They can work where they want to work. And that means that I can now recruit anywhere. So, you know, this year I've took people that live 200 miles away from our office because we work remotely, we work in a smart way. So it's helped with recruitment. So there's an opportunity there, not only to, to, to win business from further afield, but to also recruit better talent from further afield as well. So I'd, I'd really urge you to start thinking about using your video conferencing technology and the shift in your uh, prospects mindset of video technology to really push the boundaries of where you can sell your products or services. You know, think about why trade locally only? This is an addition. Use your technology, get to understand it. Remember to unmute the mic button when you're talking and it, it's much quicker for pitching. And not only is it quicker for pitching, it also saves you, save you costs. How much money will you save on fuel costs, driving up and down the country, going to meetings? How much will you save on trains? How much human time will you save sitting there, sitting on the motorway in traffic jams? And also, not only from a business perspective, but from a sustainability perspective, using technology, how much greener is your company and how much more CO neutral is your company because of that impact? So the last area I really want to talk about today is digital. Now we, everybody understands that digital is there, but lots of people and lots of businesses still seem to get confused with what digital actually means and what to do to make themselves digital. It's far more than just having a website. It's for me, it's about how your website is optimized for conversion, how your website is optimized for search to come back in search results. How your website is optimised if you're spending money driving traffic to your website. And are you being social enough? These are areas that I see businesses struggling with all the time. And 2020, as we said earlier, has fast forwarded digital you know, way above 20 years. The growth that we've seen on online inquiries for B2B customers, the growth that we've seen for e-commerce this year is completely, and I hate using this word, but unprecedented due to COVID. The growth is enormous. So how do you as a business take digital forward and get more bang for your buck? How do you make it work for you? And the first area you've got to think about is the conversion. And it doesn't matter whether you're selling products on an e-commerce website or you have a website that you're promoting a service, a B2B website. You need conversions. You either need people to add to basket in checkout or you need people to get in touch with you when they've seen your content because they believe that you're the one they need to talk to for that service. How do you do that? The, the first thing is, if your website isn't completely on par with those objectives, do not spend any money advertising the website because you'll be burning your budget. There's no point driving people to a poor experience if that poor experience just disappoints and doesn't convert. So there's things you need to think about on your website first of all. Is your website completely primed with the right messaging? I go to so many websites 
and the terminology, the layout of the website is so complex, I have no idea what this company do or how they do it or why I should uh, get in touch with that company. They put too much content on the website in terms of words. Did you know that 80% of website content is never read by the human? But the, you know that sort of makes a tug of war, doesn't it? Because if we don't want much content, that's going to put against Google's algorithm of loving content. So how do you combine that push and pull of lots of content with no content? And the answer is you create good articles on your website and you have a news section. That's where you can put all the heavy content. When you're promoting services that you offer, you don't have to give the end reader lots and lots of content. You have to give them enough content that influences them to say to the prospect, you're the company for me. You show you know how to do it, you've got the right people, you've got the right skill set, you've got the right experience. If your website doesn't have that influencing content, you're not going to get leads from it, even if you're buying traffic and, and flooding the website with traffic. There's no point in having 100,000 people hit your website every month if you, and paying for that traffic if you don't get any leads, because when they're driven there, it's a poor experience. So go and check your websites now and make sure they're optimized for your messaging, that they're optimized to get in touch. There's not a lengthy contact form to get in touch. There's perhaps a very quick form or even more bold, use an email address. Yes, you'll get spam, but is it quicker to get spam and delete it than to get somebody just to click and say, I'm interested in your service? Put a phone number there, put your Skype ID there. Give the person that's looking at your content every means they can. Have you got live chat or live video invoked so they can push one button and understand what they're doing? Have you put the right messaging on the website at the right time? This year I discovered a really good tool I'd like to share with you. It's called Poptin. It's a basically a pop-up system, but it analyzes uh, the behavior of your consumer so that when they've done so many things, you can then present uh, tailored-made content in a pop-up to get a lead. It's a really good thing and you can use it in e-commerce as well. And you can create pop-ups based on different scenarios. So if one customer spent six minutes on a service page about a particular product, you can show a pop-up about that product to get the lead. If they spent 10 seconds on five pages, you wouldn't show that. So you can tailor the messaging around their experience. But please make sure your website is optimized for conversion before driving traffic to it. If it's clumsy, if it's hard to read, if it's wordy, if it's too complex, people will click back into Google and you'll get a high bounce rate on your website. The next area is it's search optimized. Is it coming back in organic search? It's a marketer's dream to have organic traffic hit their website. It's, a, it's, the, it's the ideal. Paid search is great, but it doesn't convert as well as organic search. We want you high up in Google. Does your website have the right content? Is it programmed in the right way? Just to let you know that in January, Google are introducing a new algorithm all about site performance. They've already started leaking part of that algorithm change over the last few months. But make sure that your website is part of that algorithm and it fits that algorithm. So that come January, if you're on page one in position two at the moment, you don't all of a sudden fall off onto page four, five or six and people can't find you. Stay ahead of the game. Search engine optimization doesn't only come from the website coding. It comes from your content, from you keeping the website up to date, to you being social and, and putting engaging content out. Google is all about content. So the more content you can pump on your website, the more information, the more you put into that website, the more it's going to come back to you. But remember what I said earlier, don't overwhelm the consumer with that content. Make sure it's well laid out and the consumer gets bite-sized chunks of information, whereas the meat on the bones content is perhaps a little bit lower down the page, but Google can still get it as well. Remember that tug of war between the two. If you're doing paid search, and by paid search I mean paying Google to drive traffic to your website, paying Facebook to drive advertising, or Instagram driving traffic to your website, is your website optimized for paid traffic? And what I mean by that is when you've paid three pounds for somebody to click through to your website, is the experience that that consumer, that prospect is getting, is it the most likely to convert them to contact you? 
Are the contact methods easy? Is the content easy to read? Is it easy to understand? If you're an e-commerce website, simple things. Is the add to basket button and the product information and the price in the same area of the screen? So it's easy for the customer to click one button. If you're a B2B website, is the messaging correct and snappy enough and influencing enough? I talk about influencing content. When a prospect looks at your website and they read your content and they see what you're about, it should give them a warm feeling that you're the go-to place for that product or that service. Does your content do that? Does the layout of the page do it? If it doesn't, do not spend a penny paying Facebook, paying Instagram, paying Google, paying Yahoo to drive traffic to your website. You must optimize it first, or you're theoretically destroying your marketing budget. This year we've seen um, some very good results, and I'll share another tool with you called Instapage. And what it does, it allows you to create really good, really high impact, really high converting landing page. It's called Instapage. You install it on your website, and as marketers, you can create page content very quickly, but it's completely tracked. You get heat maps to see where people are clicking. You can do A-B testing. So you can take a, 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 a piece of content that was there and move it to there and see the result. Half the people get the content here, half the people get the content here. Which one converts the highest? It allows you to track and measure. So many people spend money on digital marketing, driving traffic to the website, but they don't understand what the traffic is doing. They don't understand that you know, moving a button from here to here will optimize it. See so many people driving paid traffic to their homepage, which is totally wrong because you drive the traffic to the homepage and then they've got to go and find the content again. This is why Instapage is really good to create bespoke landing pages for every campaign you've got. So if you've got a campaign talking about A, B and C, have a page they land on that talks about A, B and C. Also when it comes to paid search, think about the behavioral pattern of your prospect. Marketeers, good digital marketeers know that when you spend money on paid search, the first click from the consumer won't end up in a sale. That's a minority of the time, or a lead. What they know is they'll go to a website and then they click back into Google and look at some other competitors. Knowing that information and armed with that information, think about using what's called retargeting. So that if you visit a website and you pay to get to that website and you leave it, the adverts for that website then start appearing when the consumer, the lead, is Googling and browsing the internet. Yeah, it's called retargeting. So many people don't use it and it's a great tool to increase that conversion rate between a visitor and a lead or a buyer. Last time at the market class, we spoke about social media and creating engaging content. They're not, not a, a, a spam engine, it just throws out loads and loads of content, but a company, an organization that puts out real content, that gets real engagement for their customers. Companies are still not doing it. They're still not asking open questions, and they really need to. 2020 has shown us that people want to be social. They want to work and work and, and be part of companies that are social and that have a, a social conscience, that are socially responsible. Think about using your social media in that way to promote the brand position that we spoke about earlier, that John Lewis have completely nailed. If you look at that advert we looked at earlier for John Lewis, their Christmas advert, look at the campaign behind it on their social media, on their website, how it all links in. Think about how you're using your social media. Are you still going out to the world and saying, hello world, we sell this. Hello world, we do this. We've got this product, come and buy it. It's non-engaging. Think about how you can use your social media to inspire people. Inspire people to continue their journey with you. Be a leader, be inspiring. And I really stress that a lot. Now, as I said earlier, I'm gonna hold one-to-one -one workshops on a lot of these subjects if the demand is there and you guys want to do it. And we'll give you some details um, moving forward. Digital is so important. Last time, we said the DNA of businesses is those that are combining online with offline. I still believe to some relevance that's important. Click and Collect is a great example in the e-commerce world. 
The DNA of the company's going forward. We've already said are agile, ones that change, ones that adapt, ones that trade and build a community locally, ones that trade and build communities globally. But all of those will be using digital in a whole new way. Just think about us right now. I should be at an exhibition talking to you face to face, being able to reach out, shake your hand, but I can't. I'm using digital to get a, a message to you guys today. So that really ends everything we've spoke about so far when it comes to, to digital, about all the other DNA moving forward. So lastly, what I would say to you is if you do want to take this further and have more conversations, what I'd like to do is offer one-to-ones on that content, or one to a few, where we can get four, five, maximum six people to a workshop, we do them via Zoom, via Teams, via Google Hangouts, and we can discuss any part of this masterclass. If you're interested in that, you all have my email address, please drop me an email, and we will arrange some times and schedules, and we'll have some real live debate sessions and real live um, interactive sessions. Thank you so much for working. Until we meet again, please stay safe and take care.